Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Paul Needleman. I am a principal solution architect with Snowflake. Um, I'm a part of our professional services group, and I support uh, our professional services group supports um, helping customers like the solutions we're going to talk about today, uh, really around how we can use iceberg tables with interoperability with Databricks, Spark, and other uh, engines to read from Snowflake tables. So um, have a demo, and we'll be walking through that here. So we're going to talk about a quick overview of what iceberg tables are, go over the architecture, get into the demo, and then talk about what's coming next with iceberg, a little bit of things that are on the roadmap. So for folks who hopefully are somewhat aware of iceberg, we have kind of two flavors, if you will. Um, Snowflake managed tables are where Snowflake would be the writer and writes data in a customer managed bucket or Azure blob store. Um, and then other readers would use our, our uh, Spark SDK to then get access to that data through our catalog. We also have the ability to do externally managed tables, which then would have an externally managed or externally written iceberg table, so Spark writer writing to a bucket that Snowflake could then read and consume from. For this demo, though, we're going to talk about Snowflake managed, where Snowflake's going to be the ingestion pipeline, curation, and, and storing that data for other, for other readers to then uh, get access to. So hopefully pretty clear for folks who are, are familiar with Iceberg, and then we're gonna get into how this is all gonna work. So with Snowpark managed tables, what we're, we're gonna do is build a, a pipeline within Snowflake. We're gonna start with uh, mimicking a corporate data center having a, a streaming ingestion pipeline using snow, snow pipe streaming. So Kafka messages coming in about 100 a, a minute. Um, and that's going to get into uh, a raw zone um, directly in Snowflake. And then we're going to use a dynamic table to flatten that data out of the JSON format. And then use Cortex functions, some LLMs to help process that data for some really quick uh, and really uh, powerful way to you know, bring in, and I'll share that in a second, um, LLMs to, to the data and then export that, not export, but write it to an iceberg table um, incrementally. From there, the data is going to be written to uh, an Azure blob store, um, and then we'll be picking that up from Databricks and using the Spark SDK that I mentioned to then read that data in Databricks. Um, I see a few folks taking pictures. This is a, I have a QR code at the end. All this code and the, the diagram are available on GitHub, so you can, um, after the session, you can get a picture and you can get the code base. You can get this image as well as uh, the code that goes behind it. Um, the one part on Cortex functions I want to I want to stress is pretty it's pretty powerful, you know, if you think about how you know you would have to bring LLMs to data in a in a you know data lake environment, it can be pretty daunting to have your data lake exposed to you know taking data, leaving potentially leading the the data plane if you will, and having data leave to go call some of these LLMs and then bring the data back. The nice thing about this this pattern is that everything is governed and secured within Snowflake. So you're going to have your LLMs directly inside of embedded within Snowflake. You don't have to, the data is never leaving that boundary, that blue box. But then the result set of that is being made available for other readers like Spark to then query. So you're having a really secure governed environment to handle that um, data pipeline using LLMs and, and then sharing that results back for, for others. All right, so I'm going to start by just kicking off the, the Kafka job. It's going to start creating a bunch of transactions. So again, this is all available. So what's happening right now is 100 transactions are being fictitiously created, um, and they are going to be picked up in a topic. And then you can see them coming in here, and they're going to be streaming with snow, snow pipe streaming into Snowflake. Um, so I will kind of walk through what's happening in Snowflake and how the data then progresses through the pipeline. And, and ending, uh, as I mentioned, um, in Azure Blob Store and then also into Databricks. So I mentioned some of the tables. I just want to walk through what they look like. Um, the first is the dynamic table. So data is coming into the raw zone. A dynamic table is going to flatten that out. So we have a dynamic table here. It's just literally every minute refreshing incrementally from the, from the uh, Snowpipe streaming event table and just flattening it into columns, rows and columns. And you can watch the, you know, if you're familiar with dynamic, dynamic tables, you can watch um, the progress of that. I can figure out how to refresh this. Um, 
So you're, you're going to start seeing, if I can get this to load, let me refresh here. I think I might have timed out on me here. There we go. There we go. It timed out. So 621 records just came in about a minute ago, and it's going to continue to bring in those records and flatten them out. And you can see what they look like here. So this is the flattened JSON data coming in from the Snowpipe streaming. We also have um, a stream on that dynamic table, so it just helps process the incrementals. And then lastly, a task, and that task is going to uh, check if the, the stream has data, and then process and write that to um, the iceberg table, as well as using some LML, LLM functions that I'll, I'll walk through here in a second. Um, so it's using the LLM within Snowflake and then writing out to this iceberg sales transaction table. And that is here. So just a, a regular iceberg table with Snowflake catalog, which means at Snowflake managed, this is the location where the data is going to be stored, and then we're using Azure as our uh, external volume to store the data. One thing I didn't mention, um, all the features in this demo are now GA, so iceberg tables, dynamic tables, LLM functions, so you could theoretically go to your production environment today and get all this deployed. All right, so I'm just gonna do a quick kind of preview of what the data looks like. So I mentioned the data's coming in about 100 rows a minute, so um, 3,200 records so far. Uh, we looked at that looks like. Um, we now have a dynamic table that has processed that data, so uh, there's a little bit of a lag on the dynamic table, about a, a minute lag. Um, and we looked at that as well. That looks like this. And there's two pieces of information I want to show you. So this is all, you know, using the Python faker library to, to generate this data, so it's essentially, you know, can't really read it. Um, but there's two things that I wanted to, to show and how, the, how powerful the LMs are. One is I, I put in a, a fake product review. It's just, it's just gibberish, but it's, it's got text of you know, some synthetic data that would be you know, generated from uh, a customer reviewing a product. Um, so this is you know, ex the text. And then we also have an address that is all concatenated into one field. And so to kind of show how well the LMs can help cleanse this data, um, we have two functions that I wanted to highlight. One is the Cortex Sentiment, and that's going to look at the product review and give a negative one-to-one -one scale rating on is the sentiment of that review negative or positive, negative being all the way to negative one, zero being neutral, and one being a positive review, and everything in between. And then I'm also using the complete function, which is just your basic, you know, chat GPT, right? ask a question, and gives you a response. So we're kind of doing this neat little parsing here, and we say, hey, I want to give you this address field and it's concatenated form, and I would like you to parse it out for me with the following fields, which are address number, street name, unit name, number, city, state, zip, as a JSON object that we can then parse. So if I, this is uh, just a select query, this is what's gonna be in, exported. Mm. Okay. So here are the product reviews, and now I've got the sentiment scores of, again, negative one to, to one, negative two, that is just reading the data and providing a score based on what, um, uh, what, it, what it's reviewing. Again, fictitious data, so it doesn't really have a lot of meaning, but with, you can see the power of how this could be helping um, review you know, any sort of uh, sentiment analysis that you may be doing with, with just one line of code. And then in addition, the customer address, again, concatenated it the, the LLM is going to provide back a uh, JSON object that then is easy to parse and flatten out. So you can easily get states, zip codes, and without having to do any sort of you know, coding, really, it's just all in this parse a given address into the following JSON, and, and the LLM, uh, Mr. All 7B, is taking care of that for you. So again, super powerful for the data pipeline, not needing to have your data leave that secure uh, Snowflake sandbox or s Snowflake um, border, perimeter, and having the LM bring brought to the data. We All right, so um, one other quick thing before we move on to, then this is the iceberg data, one other quick thing I want to show you. So also really, really cool and, and important. When I'm using Databricks or the SDK, I created a special role called Iceberg Reader 
that reader role has only three things that's been granted to it. You guys taking a second here? Because I think I executed everything. Uh, one second. All right. It's got usage on the database, usage on the schema, and select on the table. So why that matters, there is no compute that's been granted to this role, and it's going to select and access this data through Snowflake, uh, the Snowflake SDK, but it's not using any Snowflake compute. So this is the, the, the beauty of Iceberg, right? The Iceberg data sitting in a third-party customer object store and can read that data through our catalog without needing to go through a Snowflake warehouse. So you, you know, it's, it's very much not even possible to, to use compute if you don't have access to a warehouse. Um, so I'm going to jump over now. This is the, the container uh, object store within Azure. So um, this, some of this is old, but you can see right here, there's one from 2.11. So as that data is being streamed into Snowflake, written back out to uh, the iceberg table with the task, it is then writing into this customer storage bucket um, in Azure that we can then go to um, Databricks and read. So I'm just going to clear my output here. So this is going to be fun. My, my uh, cluster started. If anyone's used to Databricks, it's going to take a little bit. I meant to have it up. It takes about five minutes, so to chat for a little bit. Um, so yeah, so the cluster starting. Um, we're really just going to you know, go through. I'll, I'll walk through. Actually, while that's starting, I can show you the properties of the Azure cluster. So I have an Azure uh, compute cluster. And really, to configure this in Databricks, and this is, again, it's any managed Spark environment. We support the SDK supports lots of different readers, Spark being one of them. So if you're using you know, EC2, or sorry, uh, EMR or other Spark environments, it would be very similar. So um, the main part is for in Databricks, the libraries. I have two libraries um, that are available to, to make this interoperability happen. One is the Snowflake JDBC driver. So that's just going to be how Snowflake communicates um, the entitlements of the users in the role to access the catalog. So you need to be able to access Snowflake. Again, no warehouse re required. And then the open source Spark runtime for Iceberg and the version of Spark Scala that you're, you're running. So in Databricks, I'm, I'm running Spark. And I just need to match that Spark runtime to the appropriate uh, version of, of the um, Databricks runtime. And then in configuration, um, I have, this is all documented on our, on our website, but um, I connect to our JDBC driver with the username and password, as well as configuring um, Spark to use the Iceberg or the Snowflake Iceberg catalog as uh, the catalog implementation, rather than using um, the Databricks catalog, which would potentially be Unity or, or Hive or something else. So we're telling it we want to use have the the Snowflake catalog available for us within the Spark environment to to read from. And. Anyone's used Databricks before, it, it does take a while. So we're still waiting for that environment to start up. In Snowflake, it would be up you know, in, in microseconds, milliseconds. Um, so we're just going to have to wait for that to start. Let's see what else. I'm going to just switch back to the slides real quick and just kind of walk through some of that content so we don't waste the time, because we only have about five minutes left. So I'll jump back and show you the, the final solution here in a second. So um, as I mentioned, you know, everything that I'm showing today is GA. It's available or will be, you know, Iceberg, everything's GA essentially today. Um, some things that I could do to help optimize my pipeline um, that are, are, are going to be coming with new features. Um, we could be, instead of using dynamic table, you could have uh, those ingestion of snow pipe directly into an Iceberg table. You could uh, use CDC and tasks and streams directly on the iceberg table that today is you know, having to go through the dynamic table first. Um, very, very cool and exciting that I, I was hoping it would be ready, uh, but not quite yet. It's going to be ready uh, here shortly. Um, dynamic iceberg table, so having an iceberg table with the CDC automatically refreshing uh, without having to go through a dynamic table then writing to iceberg. So that's like, going to reduce that like, two step of dynamic table to iceberg table into one object. Um, so it simplifies your pipeline just a little bit. Um, we have Cortex LLMs directly in this, but again, it's on a, uh, uh, it's not directly in uh, the Iceberg table. It's writing to the Iceberg table, so that would be something in addition. Um, 
Snowpark ML to be able to write. Uh, you can read Snowpark table, Snow Iceberg tables, but you can't write yet, so that's going to be coming soon, as well as a lot of storage um, maintenance, so clustering, compaction, snapshots, all that is going to be also available with Snowflake Iceberg tables, as well as data shares. And of course, Polaris, the REST catalog, uh, is going to be coming soon, and that's going to be completely open source, and it's going to allow for, for further interoperability uh, to more fine grain um, ability to, to, to access the data within Snowflake or outside of Snowflake um, with Iceberg. The cluster is up. I'm going to go to my notebook and just wanted to show kind of this working in action. Um, so I'm just going to show just kind of the steps. Uh, again, this is document or documentation, but just viewing the namespace, viewing the catalog um, objects that are available to us, viewing the tables within Spark that were created in, in Snowflake. We're waiting for this to be pretty quick now. All right. So we're going to use the Snowflake catalog. So again, there's multiple catalogs. We're going to use the Snowflake catalog. And we're going to show, I'm asking to show what a databases are available, essentially namespaces are available. So the curated database that I gave access to is there. And I want to use that database and show the tables that are available. And the iceberg sales transaction table is the only table that was granted to this user. So that's the only table that comes back. Um, and then I can just run a quick select. Um, now that I've shown that the table is available to me, I can just select out the data. Juna. Select star with a limit 10, just to bring back a, a few rows. All right, and um, you'll see here that that product review sentiment score is available as well as the parsed address that we talked about earlier into the, the customer state and zip, and that's gonna be important here in a second because I'm gonna show a, a quick um, chart that I made. So one other thing that I didn't mention yet, um, because Snowflake is managing the catalog, it's automatically updating the meta metadata in real time. So right now, I've got 13,000 records. As of waiting for the cluster to start, a lot of data was coming, coming into the pipeline. So I have 13,000 records. If I come back in a minute, it'll be higher. It's going to continue to automatically refresh in real time. As soon as that data hits the bucket, it's, it's automatically available for me, uh, the metadata, because of the, the catalog. Um, you can also use Spark data frames or PySpark data frames as seen here, just doing a quick you know, transaction show. And then I'm doing now a little bit of aggregation, light aggregation. I'm going to do a group by essentially just showing what was the sentiment score per state and try to figure out if there's a correlation of maybe some customers in certain states or stores are, are a little bit more um, happy or, or less satisfied than other states. So I'm doing a, just a quick data frame operation to aggregate the data, do a little bit of filtering, sorting, and I get back a table with the state and the score by state. And then I can use um, Python charting libraries, uh, Seaborn here, to display that output in a visual way. It's gonna be small, I'm gonna make it bigger here. Okay. Wants to show up, there it goes. So. You can see that Texas here is the most positive. Um, and then at the end, there is, you know, it gets circuiting the more negative sentiments at the bottom. For whatever reason, NA is coming back with very angry customers. So the point of the matter is you're, you're in Spark, you're in Databricks, you want to do some, some, you know, have your data scientist or someone look at the data. It's fully available to you. It's updated in real time. Again, if I go back to my, my, my row count and just do a quick refresh of that select star on the data, I now have 16,000 records, first 13,000 records, so immediately that data is, is available to you. Thank you so much for bearing with me and, and um, hope you learned something and, and uh, that's all. Thank you.